When Elon Musk revealed two futuristic Starship versions containing version 2 and version 3, a question was raised what is the V1's fate once V2 and V3 come online? Will it be moved to the rocket garden, or will it have a separate mission? Most likely SpaceX will not eliminate anyone but will, instead classify all of those rockets into four groups for each specific purpose. SpaceX revealed the next four Starship generations changing everything. Find out everything in today's episode of TechMap. First of all, let's discuss Elon Musk's initial goal when developing the Starship project, Mars colonization. In this regard, only Starship V3 will be responsible for this. The intended evolution occurs in two new versions, each one with increased payload capacity, consequently thrust propellant load and size, of course. While the V2 shows little change compared to the current prototype, the change to the V3 is the most notable showing its design specifically for deep space missions to Mars. It stands out by the largest payload capacity ever, 200 tons to orbit and Elon calculated that with 10 launches per day, the fleet of V3 can send up to 250,000 tons to Mars per opportunity and in expendable mode, that number will double. Crazy how much its payload capacity is, and I believe that this capacity would be applied to other important tasks, not only for Mars. With 400 tons per launch for the one-way trip, Starship can hold about 5,000 average European males or the whole ISS to orbit. Imagine how much more convenient if we could bring the whole space station in just one flight. Besides that, as Elon said, for giant expendable rockets, their parts could be recycled as raw materials for initial construction on Mars. If V3 serves multi-planetary life, V1 might be the perfect choice for suborbital travel, which does not require too large a payload mass or thrust. SpaceX's CEO used to mention the point-to-point -point travel on Earth by Starship with the ambition to disrupt the air travel market in the long run. This vision is strongly advocated by many people, According to them, in fact, even quality issues aside, Boeing still has a backlog of 5,300 airplanes. Airbus has an order backlog of 8,600 planes. Something about this design and production process is just not efficient or sustainable. Meanwhile, SpaceX has a very simple design and iterative philosophy to make Starship production as efficient as possible. This feels a lot like Tesla V's legacy auto, probably even more extreme. The fact that Starship doesn't use traditional airports is actually an advantage in the long run. They can probably optimize a lot there. Also think they may have an advantage when it comes to fuel costs and production. Oxygen is nearly free and green. Methane could be produced from green hydrogen and carbon capture. Speed, they have a huge advantage. When SpaceX starts dialing everything in a Starship is going to be cheaper and faster to produce as well as faster with more capacity than a traditional airplane. At the very least, intercontinental air travel will be disrupted. The opposition, on the other hand, immediately expressed concern that not everyone or every type of cargo is capable of comfortably withstanding prolonged G-force above 1 GE. Another argument is about the logistics before and after the flight. For example, a rocket can't launch and land as close to a distribution point as a plane can. A rocket might also take more preparation time, be more sensitive to weather conditions, etc. The logistic requirements of rocket launches will never be able to compete with planes, and that is not to mention the thousand other reasons this won't work out. Even the only advantage, speed, is more than made dubious by launch and landing logistics. And that ignores the question if anyone actually cares about that speed advantage. If it exists, 99% of air cargo is not that time critical that the difference even matters. Plus, once you build in the logistics, how much time do you save? We could open the holes, offload a pallet onto a truck, and it was on its way in a matter of minutes. Same for a departure. Really, the plane is probably one of the simplest parts of the whole process. The noise exhausted by rockets is also a significant matter. The Starship test has emphasized again that starting rockets is rather disruptive and affects the area around it. And it also requires very significant infrastructure for launching. Creating lots of Starship landing sites near cities seems entirely infeasible. It's hard enough in areas with fewer people, but that's not the areas where extremely fast cargo delivery would be useful. And if you assume a much higher frequency than rocket launches have now, which would be required for this, the area around the spaceport 
would be essentially uninhabitable with all the noise. Probably, it should be better for Starship to be used in some emergency cases like in the military or civilian disasters. Frequently in earthquake situations, all surface transportation is impossible and the maximum size of rescue equipment that can be airdropped is insufficient to deliver heavy excavators or field hospitals for weeks. But if a fairly generic heavy equipment shock cradle was pre-built and stored, Against need and regular Starship traffic going on a daily basis, the pallet could easily be loaded within a day and substituted for the next scheduled launch. So, do you think Starship has the potential to replace the air cargo market? Let me know in the comments. Not only suborbital transportation, but some features on V1 might also characterize Starship's lunar lander version. In the framework of Artemis III, Starship HLS is optimized for moon operations only including crew area, surface access, docking to Orion, and the removed Earth recovery hardware. So its payload only needs to be enough to accommodate a crew of up to four astronauts, along with significant cargo for lunar missions. Normally, 100 tons in total, same as the regular Starship. Its squat design compared to V3 helps it not to tip over on the lunar surface easily during landing and to reduce dead mass from the big landing gears. You know, it wouldn't be surprising if heavier variants like V2 and V3 had large landing leg scales corresponding to vehicle height and this unintentionally created significant excess mass. What's more, the lunar gateway where the rocket will dock in a lunar near rectilinear halo orbit weighs one-tenth of the ISS, so a very gigantic vehicle will not be suited to dock with it. The HLS Starship Lunar Lander requires 1,700 tons of methalox in its tanks after refilling in LAO in order to have enough propellant to do the five engine burns required to complete that mission. Once a heat shield or flight control surface is removed, the propellant storage tanks or additional tanks are modified to increase the spacecraft's fuel capacity. Starship's original variant can adapt to that quantity of propellant. Last but not least, under the pressure of a deadline in 2026, SpaceX will likely come up with its available version, V1 instead of running out of the clock, to make the next generations ready in such a short time. According to NASA, Minimizing changes in vehicle configuration and making the design and development of Starship HLS as common as possible will benefit future Starship HLS builds by eliminating the need for additional testing, evaluation, and verification of different vehicle designs. NASA added this will also allow SpaceX to accelerate vehicle builds to help ensure availability and on-time delivery for mission integration. In contrast to HLS Starship Depot requires a variant that is stretched to the peak, this drives SpaceX to make Starship's third version and they can freely upsize it to any level they prefer because the Depot version is inherently featured by maximum tank volume and floating in space. This is very important because the taller the rocket gets, the harder it would be to land somewhere with no infrastructure on the Moon or Mars's rocky surface, for example. Even you can build 300 tons plus worth of tanks on top, plus whatever you gain by removing heat shields and fins. Technically, if aerodynamics allow for it, you can take the entire shipyard much wider and taller than 9 meters wide on top, and while I don't see spaceships being built in it, I can totally see station parts being built or assembled in orbit. Keep in mind that the above analysis is only based on my personal opinion. So. If you have any ideas, please share them with me and other audiences. I'm glad to read your response. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.